Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> By way of introduction today, I'm curious if any of you are old enough to have seen a movie in 2001 called Zoolander. Yes. What do you mean? What was that face? Uh, some of you seem insulted that I would think you were that young. Um, it's hard to judge once you become 45 or so. Um, so I would love to begin with, I think it is um, a wonderful, over the top way of getting into, has anybody here heard the phrase, all models are wrong, some are useful? I didn't do my diligence to look up who said that, but it's been said that all models are wrong, some are useful, and so, to get into the extreme of wrong, here's a little snippet from Zoolander. Without much further ado, I think the mayor of Zoolander is sitting for kids who can't read. <laughs> What is this? A center for ants? What? How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside a building? There, just I don't want to hear your excuses! The center has to be at least Three times bigger than this. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, yeah, so before we get to, I have a, another model that's wrong, one that I made, but uh, does anybody want to characterize what, what went wrong in this uh, demo? The designer is showing the client something, and the way it's received isn't as expected, it would seem. Does anybody want to explain why Derek Zoolander had the problem that he had? Well, as far as models go, this is pretty hi-fi, right? And I think that is something important for us to keep in mind, well, to keep in mind always that depending on what you're trying to accomplish, the kind of model that you would use, the level of fidelity that you would use uh, is not a slam dunk. There is not a right or a correct answer probably because these models can all be, can vary so much in the level of abstraction and in the level of fidelity. And this model, was perceived as uh, a picture of an end state. And I guarantee you that as people working in UX design, especially at the upfront part of a project, if you get to work in terms of architecture, which many of us don't have that opportunity, but there's plenty of UX work going on at the start of a project. The difference between a pictorial model, a picture of an end state model. And what I think at this point in the 
project development should have been a rhetorical model, a model that's making, this is the first time Derek has seen presumably what this center for kids who can't read good is supposed to be like. And if this model had been making an argument uh, there used to be this, this tradition in architecture in the built environment where architects had to learn, and in some cases they still do, uh, mostly it's digital now, but it used to be that balsa wood and little sponges put on the end of, of tiny little straws to represent trees, that there would be a way to render a model that is making an argument for what it should be, that isn't a picture of what it will be. And I think that is essential, and that is some missing value in the ecosystem of how UX work gets done. The rush to super high fidelity prototypes, uh, people wanting to think in terms of an end state, a picture of an end state. And at this point, we're making models um, in terms of architecture that are supposed to be making an argument, not saying, not promising this is what it's gonna look like. And, and one of the reasons to, Think about this distinction, I believe, is shown in this film. Derek was made a fool. I mean, he's already a fool. But this uh, designer was not being humane to the client. Client didn't know what he was looking at. And the, the adding insult to injury, the, it has to be at least, he's trying to think of the scaling rule three times big. It still wouldn't be big enough if it was. It's, he didn't know what he was seeing. He wasn't set up to appreciate what kind of a model is this. And uh, so that's one way that models are wrong. But then we also, the second part of the quote is that some of them are useful. Um, if I can ever get past this video. Here is a model that some people have found useful uh, that I came up with in 2010 for thinking about information architecture. And I, when I came up with this, there was a contest that was sponsored by the IA Institute and funded by Peter Morville to encourage people to come up with better ways to explain information architecture. This was my entry in that contest, contest and it's had a little bit of traction. And where what I wanted to do was come up with a model that would encompass all of this great stuff that I've come to learn about, the work of Richard Saul Werman and architecting information prior to the advent of digital uh, what I've realized recently in starting to learn in my really dumb way the kinds of things that I want to learn along with you in class this term about AI, that this model is exactly in the heart of what's going on with artificial intelligence. And the stuff that you'll start doing with, you'll be doing in your groups today um, is trying to come up with models. And those of you who were in class last week, I thought it was a real treat to be shown this exceedingly simple way to model an environment. And uh, my contention is, is that if we learned this language together, this modeling language, this approach to the right level of abstraction to start making some arguments about the way something ought to be put together, that uh, this is gonna position us well to do crucial work for those of us who wanna get involved with AI, machine learning, uh, all of that kind of thing. Uh, because I don't know anything about this part of the field, I just like what you would do, right? I consume videos and I go to conferences. I try to find smart people who talk about this stuff. And Carol Smith, uh, who works at IBM, gave a talk at Midwest UX a couple months ago that I watched. And I was in the way that uh, if you fancy yourself to have come up with a good idea, to see that that good idea can uh, uh, interact with, catalyze with other good ideas, to see that the two pieces of this three-part model that I like to use to talk about information architecture, that this is absolutely how leaders in UX who are addressing machine learning and artificial intelligence, this is how they're talking about it too. So I don't believe it's that big of a stretch to talk about IA as an essential pretext to AI. And that's a terrible thing to try to keep track of, the A's and the I's. But I believe that that's how it works, that there needs to be architectures of information on the front end then of training, uh, creating, developing artificial intelligence. And this is not, and I love this note, and you should definitely watch your talk. There's a link to it in the slide. Um, this isn't how 
humans learn. This is how we've come to teach machines to learn by using things called ta taxonomies and ontologies. And uh, she doesn't uh, perseverate on those big words in her talk. It's a very accessible talk. And instead of talking about those things a lot, she what she boils it down to here, I think this is where it sort of connects up with this object-oriented modeling stuff that, that we've learned, is that this is, you could call it annotation, you could call it modeling, but that we're getting at ground truth, that there's some combination of ontology, what things mean, and taxonomy, which are ways of arranging things. And in the case of these systems, it's often language that's being arranged. That what we're doing in terms of uh, creating and helping make good artificially intelligent systems is helping to tell the truth. And uh, I think that's marvelous. And I think that maps directly into what people like Richard Saul Werman, Chris Alexander, uh, the architects that we're using in this class, this term, are very much interested in using architecture to tell the truth. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that too. Uh, there was a reading for today. I'm curious if anyone had read Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino in another course. One of us, two of us. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why I wanted you to read this. Uh, on the basis of beauty in literature alone, I think it's interesting. Uh, in terms of this being co-emergent in a really funny way with the work of Richard Saul Werman. 1972 was a very important year. It's the year of my birth. And uh, this book, Invisible Cities, came out in the same year that Richard Werman was doing a conference called The Invisible City, which was the International Design Conference at Aspen. He was the youngest board member of that organization, and he was asked to chair the conference in 72, and he chose to call it The Invisible City. And these two works, uh, uh, Werman made a book called Aspen Visible as one of the artifacts of that conference. There's also a special issue of Design Quarterly, much like the hats thing that I had you all look at. He did another full issue of that magazine uh, called Making the City Observable. And so strange that at the same time you've got Werman finding, striving, straining to find ways to make cities more visible, more transparent in the information about how they work, uh, what, what's good, what isn't good, uh, making the use of the city transparent to the people who needed to understand it. And at the same time, we have this strange work of fiction where cities, you start out thinking it's cities, plural, are being described in some of the most wonderful ways. And through this spoiler alert, uh, eventually you find out that all of the, it's about Kublai Khan and Marco Polo. And Kublai Khan loves to hear stories about cities. He says, tell me another city, tell me another city. And Marco Polo is entertaining uh, the, the emperor or whatever his, his, his uh, heraldic titling was, Kublai Khan. And uh, it turns out he's talking about Venice the whole time. And this idea that I speak, I can say whatever I want, but it's the listener who is going to affect that exchange, what happens, what kind of truth is going to be told that the listener has a huge, if not massively determinant role in that exchange. And this idea that it was the ear of Kublai Khan that could only hear certain things and that's why Marco Polo had to render this description of his beloved Venice in so many different ways because the ear was going to, needed to hear them as different let's say. And I connect that up, uh, really tightly couple that with this quote that Molly put in the textbook from Christopher Alexander. And I think this is the thing that we need to look out for. And I think this is something uh, that we could be proud of if we brought this to business, to enterprise, to the kinds of environments we're going to work in. The just to, to, to be present with this notion that the way that we're putting all of this together 
is predicated on making it so that the computer can solve the problem. And that, that is hugely biasing any kind of truth that we can tell. Much like the readiness of any hearer as a participant in this knowledge exchange that we call communication, that they have to be ready to hear it. There's this danger in the kinds of work that we all can do uh, where we cater to what the computer wants to hear and uh, that our attempts to make the computer be able to understand, which is this assignment, right? You've got a minute or more, sometimes less, of audio of somebody talking. How do you make a computer understand that? Just framing your problem space that way is going to influence what you do. And I love the way that Tom taught us a way of modeling this stuff where computers are not the only reader. Uh, where it's making all of these uh, relationships that we're modeling legible to humans, telling a human truth at the same time it's trying to tell computers about that truth. Another slide from that presentation by Carol Smith. Uh, these artificially intelligent systems are only as good as the data and time that we spend improving them. And there's no shortage of data and time being thrown at improving these things. Um, and here's the, the thing they get biased based on what they are being taught. I'm, I think there might be a typo in the slide, I'm not sure, but I will uh, verbally amend it to say, these things are biased based on what they are taught. And there are, if you look up Siri fail, it's, it's, it's funny because it's true, and then there's some tragic ones in there, and I didn't know if they were concocted, so I didn't want to bring those in here, but here's uh, one from Luke Robleski that I think is pretty true, his wife's name is Amanda, uh, Siri, what can I help you with? Uh, Luke says, send Amanda my current location. Siri says, okay, I'll send this to Amanda Robleski, got that right. And the message text is my current location. There is a way of modeling human behavior that could have caught that. Seems like an obvious one, right? Those of you who have used other artificially intelligent helpers, Siri seems to be stunted in her development relative to, uh, my sense is Alexa probably could have pulled this one off. Um, or what is donkey in French? And uh, looks like there's about 15,000 of them, I guess. Or, or uh, yeah, population history from 61 to 2008. Wonderful information. Uh, not what we are asking for. So there are biases in how these things have been trained. Would you not agree? And what I really am hopeful for, what I want to see some of you do in the world, is to find ways to build, to teach these systems to have better biases, to teach these systems to honor humanity. Uh, apropos the thing that Paul Daniels didn't want to talk about, he talked about it as being something about PC. Uh, the how do we address justice in terms of humans and their needs to use bathrooms. I think if we were involved in this project, we could create a model that describes that human reality. There are at least two different ways to make this model. And one of them incorporates and encompasses everything that the other wants to make happen in the world. The model on the right, that there is a one-to-one -one cardinality relationship with gender for a person, and you pick one. If we set up an object model, if we were helping build a computer world that is attached to the physical world, if we chose to set that up to tell the truth about the environment, as a person has gender, and the cardinality, it's a one-to as many as we like. Uh, both of these could be formalized, codified into the system. This is the sort of thing that would teach an artificially intelligent system how to think about the world. For any of you who have tried to make a little tiny improvement to a website form, to change a binary gender form to be something other than that and have been told no, this is a picture of one of the reasons why. Somebody made a model of the world. All models are wrong. Some of them are useful. The one on the left is more useful. It can do what the one-to-one -one mapping people 
someone like Paul Daniels, let's say, I don't know for sure that that's his belief, but say that it is, everything that he wants to accomplish can be accomplished by the one on the left, not so the other way around. And at the level that we would be working at, who would be anticipating this? At this very low level of object description that we would be, and I loved, uh, some of you may have heard it, Tom said it as an aside last week, Software, all that is, all software is, the code that people make off of this, is formalizing and adjudicating policies. That's all software is. Um, you could say the same about the built environment, the way that Paul was showing it to us. When he signs his name on that set of drawings for the building, he's saying that this is up to code. This complies with a formalized set of policies that have been adjudicated in a certain way, in the built environment, it's through the licensure of architects. Uh, in our environment, there is, it's still pretty fast and loose. Uh, I encourage you to be a member of the Information Architecture Institute, but we don't have a code of ethics that would help you make this decision. Uh, building one or the other of these models would probably take equally as much time. But the choice that you make, back to telling the truth, establishing the ground truth for what the system can learn. Uh, here's more proof of what Richard says. The organization of information creates new information. Uh, one of these creates new information about uh, what people are like. The other one closes that down and makes it very um, limited. So I'm excited to be able to use this way of describing, and I sent this to a colleague of mine who is a trained business analyst. I am still dumb enough in this that I drew these on my computer and then I had to send them to Daniel at my office to say, is this right? Is this methodologically correct? And he said, yeah, you're right. So my little dumb ones, those are right. And then he was fascinated by this, so he started to play with it too. Uh, what is a bathroom? If we had the object of bathroom, if we're working in uh, the way that buildings are built today, Computer systems describe all of this stuff. So what is a bathroom? Uh, a bathroom has a relationship with utility, refuge, social control, right? Like the choice to include that in a description of the truth of the world uh, isn't saying uh, we're taking sides. It's saying what's going on here? What are the forces in the environment? And whether or not uh, the model on the right there, there's no cardinality involved there. And I'm not sure if uh, gender has, I, I think it has more than three. Um, so I would go back to, I prefer my model uh, for that piece of this. And because this doesn't have the cardinality, this isn't, it's got a box around it, right? So that's kind of making it look like there's just three. Uh, but how you choose to set this up can be a reflection of your values as a maker. They can be a reflection of your client's values. And if you choose to be at variance with those, uh, whether or not you uh, let on, you know, if I'm working for a very conservative organization and I'm building a model like the one on the left here that allows for their preferred model, is that something I need to talk about? Is that a thing in the stand-up at the end of the week? By the way, we finished the database for the blah, blah, and I left the door open for somebody to have a more generous idea of gender than what you have. Is that a, is that a conversation you wanna have with your client? I don't know, but it, it does give you the opportunity at a minimum to have this reflect your belief system and then be ready to talk about it if anybody notices. Um, and at a maximum, it's, a, it's another opportunity to, to talk about formalizing working through what are the forces in the environment that this thing needs to work for. So I love this stuff. Um, yes, and those of you who read to the end, so after Marco Polo uh, lets Kublai Khan uh, in on this, his secret, he's been talking about Venice all along, then somehow they're flying through the air, or no, they're, they're looking at a, an atlas all of the territories that Kublai Khan has conquered. And one of the territories on the map is the uh, uh, set of concentric cir circles described in Dante's Inferno. 
And uh, the response of uh, Marco Polo to seeing that on the map, um, that we could seek to learn and recognize who and what in the midst of the inferno are not the inferno. And, make, and then make them endure, give them space. Something about the way we draw the map could protect those who are uh, unjustly in hell. That we could restructure, we could make maps and models that would allow the, uh, uh, a more just way for people to endure and to give space to all people. So, for today, we have a very strange thing. Uh, I have a folder full of MP4s on the Canvas site. Each one of those is named for your group, and each one of those is screen video of me recording my Audible player playing snippets of audio from a Twin Peaks uh, Agent Cooper talking into his microphone. So I'm going to invite you after we take a very quick break. If we're not sitting in groups, let's sit in our groups. And then uh, I will play.